thank the organizers for uh, having me to speak to you today. Uh, it's, a, it's a little bit of a stressful experience. Normally I speak about a topic that my lab's been working on for 10 years, but today I want to talk about something that's a little bit more relevant and a little closer to my heart. So I'm a scientist, and uh, that means uh, what I do is mainly a uh, process of discovery. Uh, occasionally, uh, and largely by accident, I invent something useful. But for the most part, uh, I'm a detective. Uh, I try to understand, for example, how fruit flies fight viruses, or how mice make mature sperm. Uh, but uh, I don't stop being a scientist when I go home. Uh, I don't stop being a scientist when I go on vacation. Uh, I don't stop being a scientist uh, when I go out drinking with my friends, which may explain why all my friends are scientists. <laughs> and I don't stop being a scientist when I'm given one of those life challenges like my dishwasher breaks. So when my dishwasher breaks, the first thing I do is I relish the opportunity to take something apart. Because that's what I do for a living. So I'm taking a fruit fly apart, I'm going to take a dishwasher apart. It's bigger, so it's easier. And uh, when I take the dishwasher apart, um, it's the process of discovering how a dishwasher works, figuring how it's supposed to work and what's wrong with it, that gives me great pleasure. I can afford, because I've been fortunate in life, to hire a professional to repair my dishwasher, but I don't. I would never give up the opportunity to take apart something like a dishwasher. Now, I have friends who are scientists and who tell me, uh, much to my disbelief, that they are not handy. Handy. Uh, and yet, if I were to take a dishwasher in the lab, they would all stop what they were doing and watch. And as soon as they figured out how a dishwasher works and what was wrong with the dishwasher I was disassembling, they would abandon me. They have no interest in watching me put the dishwasher back together because that's the boring part. It was the process of discovery that was exciting to them. So I put a dishwasher, uh, I, mean, sorry, I fix a dishwasher the same way I do science in the lab. The first thing I do is I guess what's wrong with it. Now the dishwasher is closed, so I have to sort of imagine what's inside of it. And I guess the problem with this dishwasher is that uh, the pump is clogged. Now, I've never seen a dishwasher pump before, but all pumps essentially evolve from the very first pumps that were ever uh, brought into me by human invention. And so they have certain common features that will help me recognize a modern dishwasher pump that I've never seen before. So I made I made my guess. The pump is the problem. I take the dishwasher apart. I find the pump. I take it out. It's not clogged. Am I disappointed? No. Am I frustrated? No. This is great. My hypothesis was wrong, and I get to keep taking the dishwasher apart further. So I formulate a second hypothesis that's also empirically testable. I say, I bet it has no electricity because the circuit breaker in the basement tripped. Now you see, I didn't start with that one because that was less fun. I just go downstairs to the basement, throw the circuit breaker, and never get to take the damn thing apart. So now, I go to the basement, and I say, how am I going to test this? So it's kind of cheating, right, if I look at the circuit breaker to see this trip. So I go back up to the dishwasher, and I say, the test is whether or not the panel lights up. So I look at the dishwasher. There are no lights. I go back to the basement. The circuit breaker is tripped. I throw it. I'm excited. I was right. So there are two differences here from things I do in the lab. And I think that there are only two the first is when I fix the dishwasher, my wife never says to me, I'd like to see you fix it again to see if it's reproducible. And the second is, I never get to write a manuscript entitled, Zaymor Abandons Campaign Promise to Unclog Pump. Of course, I still have to put the 
pump back in because I took it out. Now, I want you to understand and imagine what I feel like at the very moment I discover the pump is not clogged. So, that's the moment in which I have definitively, using empirical evidence, proved myself wrong. I feel elated. And I feel elated because, first of all, I no longer have to cling to this mistake of hypothesis. I get rid of it, and I can make a new hypothesis that has a better chance of being working. Second, I can be proud of myself because I've stuck to the scientific method, and I have uh, gone through a process in which my beautiful hypothesis, in the face of ugly data, still is wrong, no matter how beautiful. Which brings me to what is wrong with politics in America. <laughs> <laughs> so politicians and scientists both live for ideas. And there are some really smart politicians in America. But unfortunately, although scientists have ideas and politicians have ideas, that's the point at which they diverge. You see, Proving yourself wrong in science is a virtue. Because you get to change your mind when you're wrong. And in politics, changing your idea and admitting it is wrong is a failure. It's such a failure that we call people who change their ideas in the face of evidence, in the political forum, flip-flops, hypocrites. We say they're inconsistent. And the New York Times sneers at that. Zaymour abandons campaign promise to unclog pump. The New York Times never writes, Zaymour wisely abandons foolish idea for a more useful one. So why is it that our politicians have great ideas and yet have no interest in changing their minds when they're wrong. And I look forward to the opportunity to be wrong, provided, of course, I'm the one who I showed I was wrong, because nobody likes having somebody else publish that they were wrong. Why is it that we have these two different views? And I maintain that it's a difference in culture. The culture of politics is one of consistency demanded that evidence, empirical evidence, be swept aside when it contradicts beautiful ideas. The scientific culture rewards me for changing my mind. It's not that I'm a better or stronger person than the politician. Rather, it's that my incentives are different. When I'm wrong, and I admit it, and my data are good, but my idea is wrong, my colleagues pat me on the head. They say, well, it's about time you changed your mind. We all knew you were wrong. Thank you. You're terrific. You now use the scientific method to test your idea. You admitted it was wrong. Your facts were beautiful. Your idea was gorgeous but wrong, and you abandoned it for an uglier idea that actually might be right. Now, long before Kelly Ann Conway, Point the term alternative facts. Facts were actually becoming an alternative in the political sphere. If we can take facts and set them aside and cling to an idea that the facts suggest might be wrong, then we have to get rid of the facts. Alternative facts as a concept rejects the very idea of empiricism. It presumes not that some truths are subjective, but that all truths are subjective. It presumes that no objective fact is possible that can ever dismantle a beautiful idea. It is the opposite of science, where we value the truth above all. I look to the left and I look to the right in politics, and I see no one who is willing to abandon a beautiful idea in the face of empirical evidence. 
Where are the conservatives who say, we've cut taxes over and over and over, and they haven't stimulated our economy. Perhaps we need to raise taxes. Where are the liberals who say, we have this beautiful idea for how to improve society so that there are no more poor people, and yet the poor are still among us. Perhaps there are some better ideas among the conservatives, and we will adopt them if we are wrong. Now, empirical means subject to observable tests. If something is observable, it's empirical. For example, my cats are the supreme empiricists. My cats see a wine glass on the counter, they push it off, it breaks on the floor, they say, there might be something to these laws of gravity. They do it again, it breaks, and they do it again the next day, and it still breaks, and they conclude the laws of gravity are probably right, but more tests are needed. Empirical science uh, demands that we find those observables that are trustworthy. Now, sure, we are right to be skeptical about the power of observations. People go to jail from honest misperceptions, false memories. But the, and we know that the more power, politics, money, sexuality is involved, the more biased our observations can be. But the difference between an empiricist and a skeptic is that an empiricist believes that there is a way to distinguish between trustworthy data and biased data, between data that has a chance in the right context done carefully to be truth instead of simply opinion. In other words, we work as scientists to believe that there are ways to improve our ability to distinguish between believable data and biased data. And we get it wrong lots of times. We get it wrong chiefly, I think, because of incentives that are wrong, like publishing more with reading produces, in most countries, a higher salary for academics. And so the drive to publish makes us take shortcuts. But in the end, we value empirical truth. And in valuing empirical truth means that we have to be willing to change our minds in the face of empirical truth that proves us wrong. Contrast this to politics, where empirical truth is irrelevant. Because to change one's mind, is a political liability. If you change your mind, the voters do not say, wow, you did this beautiful test, you collected this economic data, and your lovely idea was wrong, and you changed your mind publicly. No, we say, I think I'll vote for your opponent. What do we need to demand in order to change uh, our politician's attitude to our ideas? We need to demand that, first and foremost, the ideas that they propose that are testable be subject to empirical tests determined to be fair and truthful. And then, second, and more importantly, we must reward them for changing their minds. We must change the incentives. And as voters, we have the power to do that. We can say, your idea was beautiful, but it's wrong. Perhaps an ugly idea is right. And if the politician says, you know what, if the data show I'm wrong, I will change my mind, you should say, and I will vote for you. So I conclude with this thought. If we are to escape the world of alternative facts, we must learn to love flip-floppers. <laughs>